What does the healing of the nations accomplish? Would you say that the human race is overall healthy? Is that how would you just des- how you would describe us as people? Or would you say that the human race is plagued with sickness and disease? You might be on the fence as to the answers to each of those questions. So think about this. If someone you knew told you that they had the flu or COVID or cancer, would that surprise you? You might be surprised that it's that particular person, but you wouldn't be surprised at the concept. The concept of sickness is not foreign to humans. In fact, it's common, it's normal. Hospitals, pathologists, doctors clinics, doctors offices, these sort of buildings are common to us. Why? Because all of us get sick at one point or another. Again, it's unfortunate, but it's normal in life. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 gives a very interesting diagnosis on the health condition of humans. How are we? What's the diagnosis? Let's find out together at Romans chapter 5 and verse 15. We're going to start from the word through. Romans 5 12, sorry. Through one man, sin entered into the world and death through sin. So death spread to all men because they had all sinned. Verse 12 explains that we as humans all have sin. What is that? Imagine an archer shooting for his target. He hits the target. We would call that a perfect shot. We as humans, we don't do that. Imagine another archer who fires his arrow and he misses the target. We would call that an imperfect shot. That is what we do as humans, unfortunately. That's what sin means, to miss the target. For the archer, the target is the bullseye. But for us as humans, the target is perfect obedience to our creator. Unfortunately, we can't do that. We miss often. Sin essentially means to miss the target. So that's the condition that all of us have inherited from our first parents. There's nothing we could have done to avoid it personally. It's just how we were all born as sinners. Now, if you think of the archer, suppose the reason he misses the target is he's partially blind. The partial blindness that he has manifests itself in archery, but it'll also manifest itself in other areas in life. Reading, walking, driving, sports, anything involving his eyes, the blindness becomes apparent. And it's similar with sin. It manifests itself in a wide variety of areas in life, including our health, including how we reason, think, the decisions we make, our attitudes. All of these areas we could boil down to two categories, physical and spiritual. You recall that the reason or the explanation behind what sin is, is we miss the target of perfect obedience. So one area it manifests itself is in our relationship with God. We are born enemies of God. We are alienated from him. So that's one manifestation. The others are the physical things, such as the sicknesses we suffer. So as humans, It's clear to see that, unfortunately, we're not well, we're imperfect. We're, as verse 12 explained of Romans 5, we're sinners. So we need help. We need a cure. Jehovah God is the greatest physician and doctor ever. He can help us. If you think about it now, when you're sick, what do you do? You look for a doctor, someone that can treat what you have. What do you look for in the doctor? You look for expertise and reputation. You need both. If the doctor only has one, it's risky. If he has the expertise in what you have, but he doesn't have a good reputation, it might not work. If he has a good reputation, but no expertise in the disease you're suffering from, he might be worse. So you need both. Jehovah has a reputation 
and the expertise for treating both physical and spiritual sickness. The Bible contains many cases of individuals and groups of people that he has helped recover from physical sickness and spiritual sickness. So to help us get an idea of Jehovah's ability to do so, we're going to look at a few examples of individuals, groups of people that he has helped in both these areas. The first we're going to look at is a Jewish male aged 39. His name was Hezekiah, and he suffered from a malignant boil. We're going to read the account in 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 1 to 3. What we're interested in is how did Jehovah help Hezekiah? So that's 2 Kings chapter 20. I'm going to start from verse 1. It says, In those days Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came and said to him, This is what Jehovah says. Give instructions to your household, for you will die, you will not recover. But that he turned his face to the wall and began to pray to Jehovah. I beg you, O Jehovah, remember please how I have walked before you faithfully and with a complete heart, and I have done what was good in your eyes. And Hezekiah began to weep profusely. Hezekiah is terminally ill. At the point of death, he's been instructed to prepare his household to continue after him. Hezekiah prays, and Jehovah lovingly intervenes. What happens? Let's read on verse 4. Isaiah had not yet gone out the middle courtyard when Jehovah's word came to him, saying, Go back and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, This is what Jehovah, the God of David, your forefather, says, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Here I am healing you. On the third day, you will go up to the house of Jehovah. I will add 15 years to your life. Here I am healing you. It was as simple as that. Jehovah cured Hezekiah. Compassionately, with feeling yet without difficulty or hesitation. Further, Jehovah added 15 years to his life. He guaranteed the next 15 years of his existence. Such is the ability of the great healer, Jehovah God. The fact that the illness was terminal, how long Hezekiah had it for, Hezekiah's age was no obstacle to Jehovah. He cured him. Here I am healing you. Let's look at another example. Our next example is not of an individual, but a group of people. You see, later in the nation of Israel's history, the whole country became seriously and extremely spiritually ill. Hosea chapter 10 verse 1 described the condition of the people of Israel at that time. So let's have a look at the diagnosis in Hosea chapter 10 and verse 1. It reads, Israel is a degenerate vine, yielding its fruit. The more his fruit increases, the more he multiplies his altars. The better his land produces, the more splendid his sacred pillars. The whole nation of Israel was spiritually sick. False worship was spreading like a virus, and the people worshipped anything and everything. They were involved in some of the most sordid and disgusting practices. As our image shows, it was demonic. Jehovah, the great physician, chose to administer some very strong medication on the nation in the form of 70 years of exile in Babylonia. The results of that strong medication were breathtaking. In advance, Jehovah, through his prophet, explained to the Israelites what the results would be after they had been treated. And we read that description in Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6. What happened to the Israelites post-Jehovah's strong medication? Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. And we just keep in mind that spiritual health was the issue here. So what we're reading... Spiritual. 
At that time, the spiritual eyes of the blind will be opened and the spiritual ears of the deaf will be unstopped. At that time, the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the spiritually speechless will shout for joy. For waters will burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert plain. Jehovah restored the spiritual condition of the entire nation of Israel, brought them back from exile, spiritually healthy. The whole country. It was a miracle. And they worshipped Jehovah in pure worship. These two examples give us an idea of the ability and scope of Jehovah's capacity to heal individuals and groups of people. If we fast forward in time to the first century, Jesus appeared on the scene as the Messiah and Jehovah empowered him to heal others. How much of that ability did Jesus have? Let's find out in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35 and 36. Jesus arrives as the Messiah. He's bestowed with the ability to heal. How much of it does he have? Matthew 9, 35 and 36. Jesus set out on a tour of all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and curing every sort of disease and every sort of infirmity. There was nothing Jesus came across that he couldn't cure. Everything was being cured. People were coming to him in droves, and he helped all of them. As our image shows, various diseases, every sort of disease and infirmity. Jesus then empowered his disciples or apostles to be able to do the same thing. How much of it did they have? Turn over to chapter 10 of Matthew. Let's read verse 1. So Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits in order to expel these and to cure every sort of disease and every sort of infirmity. So they also gained this ability to assist others. Now there's something interesting we want to highlight here. In the previous chapter, Matthew 9, 35, 36, we read that Jesus cured every sort of disease, every sort of infirmity, but in the same verse it explained that Jesus taught and he preached the good news of the kingdom. So people were being assisted in two ways, physical healing, which was apparent, obvious to the eyes, but also spiritual healing. They were taught the truth about Jehovah, his personality and his kingdom and what it would do. So twofold healing was taking place during the first century, starting with Jesus' work in his ministry. Physical, spiritual healing. At the end of the first century, something very interesting happened. Physical healing stopped. It passed away, as the Bible said it would. Spiritual healing, however, continued. Why? Between the two, physical and spiritual, spiritual is far more important. How might we illustrate that? Imagine you're chopping fruit and you cut your finger. It's not a deep cut, but you draw blood. That's a problem. On the other hand, imagine that you have an autoimmune disease. So your immune system doesn't know whether something's supposed to be in your body or not. So it makes wrong decisions about viruses, about healthy processes that happen in your body, making you very sick. The cut in your finger, it's isolated. It's a problem. The autoimmune disease is systemic. It's all of you. The two are different, but if you could fix one, you definitely want to fix the autoimmune. And even though the problems are apparently different, they're related. If you can get your immune system healthy, it will actually send help to the part of your body that needs it and fix it. In like manner, spiritually, our issue as humans is we miss the target. Perfect obedience to Jehovah. So spiritual healing begins to directly help with that. And that actually has a flow-on effect to physical healing. The two are related, and we'll cover that a little bit more in our talk later. So physical healing achieved its purpose in the first century. It showed people that nothing was incurable, for one thing. It also demonstrated that God's favor had shifted from the Jews to the Christian congregation. 
Once those objectives were complete, physical healing stopped. Spiritual, however, continued. If you think about healing or curing, it's a little bit of a science. If you're prescribed a jar of pills by your doctor to take, you don't just take all of them or you don't take what you feel like. There's usually a program. Take so many tablets so often for so long a period of time. Or if you've torn ligaments, broken your ankle or something of the sort, you don't do nothing for 12 months. You rest for a period. Then you might start with stretches, light exercises, etc. But there's a system to how you get better. We as humans, we get sick all the time. We know this because it happens every time we're trying to get better. So it shouldn't surprise us that the greatest physician, Jehovah, is systemic or systematic in his approach to helping humans. It shouldn't surprise us that he himself has a program to assist us in recovering from sin and death. That program is actually found in the Bible. For example, we might call the period before Jesus phase one. If you look at the examples in the Bible of various cures, such as Hezekiah, the nation of Israel, in the Hebrew scriptures, they appear sporadic, but they're not. What do we learn from phase one? Well, we learn that Jehovah can help us spiritually and physically. Imagine having a disease and you know that people have had it before you and none of them have survived. None of them have even recovered. What would that do for your confidence? You would naturally feel hopeless. Imagine, though, if people had survived, if they had been helped to recover. Once you have the disease, you're going to have a lot more hope and confidence that you can do the same. So the examples in the Hebrew scriptures of Jehovah healing humans, groups of people, gives us that confidence that although we are sinners, we miss the mark, Jehovah can help us, just as he helped all of these examples in the Hebrew scriptures. That's phase one. Phase two is when Jesus appears and cures everything, every sort of disease, every sort of infirmity, helps his disciples to do the same. Phase two, what do we learn from this phase? Well, a number of things. One, we learn nothing is incurable for Jehovah. As long as a person's willing, he can help them, regardless of the issue or problem they have. We learn this from Jesus' ability to cure the disciples' ability to cure, given to them by Jehovah. Another thing we learn from phase two is spiritual healing, physical healing. Spiritual is far more important. Consider phase two. The Jews had access to both, spiritual healing, physical healing. They took the physical, rejected the spiritual. They rejected Jesus. What happened to them? As a nation, Jehovah rejected them. Jehovah chose somebody else. Who did he choose? He chose the Christian congregation of anointed ones. There's a description given of the Christian congregation of anointed ones in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Let's read it together. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. It says of these ones, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for special possession, that you should declare abroad the excellencies of the one who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. So the Jews rejected spiritual healing, so they were rejected. Christian congregation was chosen, healed. They were a special possession to Jehovah. And they were tasked with declaring abroad or telling others about everything that Jehovah had done for them. In other words, helping others spiritually. And that's what phase three is all about, assisting or focusing on spiritual healing. And phase three has been continuing from the death of the last of the apostles right until now. So we are currently in phase three. And through the ages of time, Many people have benefited from the healing, spiritual healing that Jehovah has offered. Let's consider some statistics from the 2021 service year. We had 171,393 baptized in between 
last September and August this year. That's 171,393 new individuals who have chosen to benefit from the spiritual healing that Jehovah has offered and been offering. On average, we had almost 6 million Bible studies each month in the last service year. That's almost 6 million people, new ones, who are interested in availing themselves of the spiritual healing that Jehovah has provided and is providing through the congregation. After phase three comes phase four, the last one. What's the transition from phase three to four? Consider the world. We live in a wicked and deteriorating world. At the same time, Jehovah has been offering spiritual healing and the prospect of living forever to any one who wants it. Many have responded. Some have accepted and benefited from the spiritual healing Jehovah has been offering. Others have either ignored or rejected it. All the same, very soon Jehovah will send his heavenly armies led by Jesus Christ to execute judgment on this wicked world and rid it of all wickedness. Only those who have accepted spiritual healing will survive. Everybody else will be destroyed. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 paints the picture of what will happen for us. Let's read it together. Revelation chapter 7. And we're going to start from verse 9. It says, after this, this is after the wicked system has been removed and wicked people destroyed. After this, I saw and look a great crowd which no man was able to number out of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Verse 14. Who are these ones? Who is this great crowd? Verse 14 gives us the answer. We're going to start from the word these. Who's the great crowd? These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So at Armageddon, when this wicked system of things is destroyed, only those that have accepted spiritual healing will survive, as our picture shows with what looks to be the wicked system in the background. These ones survive. What happens next? Look down to verses 16 and 17 of the same chapter. Speaking of the great crowd, it says, They will hunger no more, nor thirst any more, neither will the sun beat down on them, nor any scorching heat, because the Lamb, who is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and guide them to springs of waters of life. And God will wipe out every tear from their eyes. So these survivors will be guided to springs of waters of life. What is that? Turn to chapter 22 of Revelation and let's look at verse 1. It reads, And he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, flowing out from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of its main street. On both sides of the river were trees of life producing 12 crops of fruit, yielding their fruit each month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. So what is this river of water of life? Well, if we think about water, it's essential to life. It has cleansing and rejuvenating properties. We need it to exist. So the river of water of life pictures all of Jehovah's provisions through Christ to rid humans of sin. Jehovah has provided and will provide various things through Christ, the king of his kingdom, to help us as humans shed sin and instead become perfect. So this river represents that. What does that mean for us? 
in everyday life? How does that change things? Revelation 21, 3 and 4 describe how that changes things for us. Let's have a look together. Revelation 21, verse 3 and 4. With that I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Look, the tent of God is with mankind, and he will reside with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. And he will wipe out every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither will mourning, nor outcry, nor pain be any more. The former things have passed away. The river of water of life will help us get rid of sin. Sin will gradually be removed from all humans. If sin no longer is in us, then death will no longer ever follow. If sin is no longer in us, then we will no longer be alienated from Jehovah or will no longer miss the target, will hit the target. Perfect obedience will be possible. So our relationship with the true God will be no longer enemies, no longer make mistakes. It will be perfect. And because of that, our relationship with Jehovah will be perfect. So as verse 3 describes, we will be so close to Jehovah, even though we live on earth, it's like we live with Jehovah because the relationship is fixed. Sin is no longer there. Verse 4 describes the physical side of what that means. Death is no longer there. We'll no longer have hospitals, doctors' clinics, anything to do with the medical industry. We'll all be perfect. So we'll no longer get sick, ever. We will have a perfect relationship with Jehovah. And if we look at our image, that flows through to all other areas of life, how we think, our attitudes, our reasoning, our relationship with others, The world will be different. It will be a beautiful place. And that is the incredible and astounding future that we're looking forward to. The river of water of life, the provisions from Jehovah through Christ, will help us to become that, as our image shows. What can we do now, given that is all to come? Well, we can continue to benefit from spiritual healing, which Jehovah has been providing through the Christian congregation. So we attend the meetings, and what happens here? We receive spiritual food. It's the arrangement. It's the provision through which we can continue to be assisted. It helps us to draw closer to Jehovah and helps us begin addressing missing the target in that we keep improving our relationship with him. Think about Jesus and his disciples. They had this valuable information. They didn't keep it to themselves. They shared it. And we can do the same. We've been benefiting from spiritual healing through the Christian congregation. We don't want to keep it to ourselves. We want to help others to benefit as well, any who are willing. So let's think about our family members. Let's think about our friends, people we work with. The invitation is there to come take life's water free. Can we extend it? In doing so, we imitate Jesus. The offer is open to all for now. So let's invite all we can to respond to the invitation to take life's water free. We and all who listen to us will enjoy peace, joy, and eternal life as we benefit from Jehovah God's great healing program.